Hello, BISC 130. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 5-4. Uh, going backwards, if you're, you know, you're counting chapters in the textbook, back to chapter 17. And so this may seem strange uh, to have not covered this, you know, when it, when it should have been covered, you know, after 16, but before 18. Uh, but there's a reason why I saved this for the very end. Um, what we're going to talk about in this chapter is going to pull in uh, a lot of things that we've learned throughout the quarter. It makes a good capstone for the entire BISC 130 course because it pulls in a lot of concepts and ideas from throughout this quarter. Uh, the other thing I want to say about this chapter just in general, there is a biotechnology chapter in the textbook. Uh, I, I'm going off script for this. And so, sorry if you've been following along closely with the textbook, but for this one, I'm totally off of that. Um, there are a lot of biotechnology topics that are very interesting. Everything from genome sequencing to CRISPR-Cas9 to genetic engineering of food. I picked one big biotechnology topic that I want to focus on for this entire chapter for the next two recorded lectures uh, because one, as we'll see, it's very frequently used, and two, I, I personally know a lot about it, so I wanted to pick something that was well within my wheelhouse of personal expertise uh, so I could answer even tiny little fiddly questions about it because, yeah, I think that's important. So what is this technique? What is this chapter going to focus on? Well, I'm going to focus on something called molecular cloning. So this is this is not whole organism cloning, like cloning a sheep or something like that. This is uh, on, on the molecular level specifically, this is on the protein level. So as complicated as this is going to get, uh, as we go into, you know, the details and the sub steps of this or whatever, I think it's always important to keep in mind the big picture. Don't lose sight of the main purpose of this entire thing. The main purpose is to get protein. Molecular cloning is frequently used in molecular biology labs, really any sort of research lab that's working with, you know, small stuff, with proteins, with DNA, you know, stuff like that. Frequently used in these labs to get large quantities of pure protein. Uh, a lot, again, these labs, they're asking questions, they're doing experiments, they're trying to figure out how, you know, these things work. Uh, they need protein to set up those experiments. And this is a technique that's going to give them, these labs, this the protein that they need. So I can summarize this in a single slide and obviously we'll we'll go through in more depth but this is a pretty good overview of how the technique works overall so we're going to start by getting the gene and this just says dna fragment but this is the gene for what i'm calling protein of interest again the whole purpose of this is to get protein. It could be any protein you want. I'm using the phrase protein of interest. So, uh, yeah, s step one. Uh, get the gene for the protein of interest. Uh, importantly, and this will come back to us before too long, we're going to need a lot of that. We're going to need a very high concentration of that gene's DNA, but we're going to need the instructions, the genetic instructions, for how to build the protein that we care about. Now, what we're going to do uh, eventually is put this gene into a bacterial cell and grow up those bacteria. However, if we just give a linear short little piece of DNA to bacteria, they're probably just gonna break it down and use it for parts. They're not gonna do anything important with it. If we want these bacteria to read that gene and make our protein from this blueprint, we have to put this gene in a context that they understand. This is where the vector, also known as a plasmid, comes into play. Uh, plasmids are things that bacteria use as a way to carry extra genes. Again, it's something they recognize, something they're familiar with. So we're going to take our gene of interest, put it into the plasmid, and next we'll give that to the bacteria. So if I want to continue my numbering, step number two of molecular cloning, put gene of interest in a vector slash plasmid. We'll, we'll use these terms interchangeably. A plasmid is... The only key term in this chapter, I believe, but plasmid is defined as a small optional circular DNA molecule. And importantly, we don't have these. If you're trying to think about our biology and our nucleus and stuff like that, all our DNA is, is just in our normal chromosomes. These are extra little pieces of DNA, but bacteria are familiar with these things. Uh, 
Uh, and yeah, then we're going to put this slightly bigger plasmid into bacteria. Uh, put the plasmid into bacteria. I've been saying bacteria over and over and over again. I should clarify uh, virtually all the time, this is Escherichia coli, E. coli. You, you probably hear E. coli and think, ooh, food poisoning, you know, horrible diarrhea, something like that. Um, there are strains of E. coli that are pathogenic, uh, but most E. coli, completely harmless. We use this in labs because it is very easy to take care of. It grows very quickly and we know a lot about its genetics. So yeah, E. coli is the bacteria of choice um, almost all the time. So once this gene within a plasmid is in the bacteria, the bacteria will grow and divide. And because their genetic code, if you remember this from many chapters ago, because the E. coli genetic code is the same as everyone else's genetic code, they will express that gene uh, as you let the bacteria grow. They will express that gene and make the protein of interest. Uh, and here is kind of where this particular figure stops, just showing little colonies of bacteria. But if we want to continue it until we actually have protein in hand, what we're going to have to do is bust open these bacteria, purify your protein from all the other proteins because again these are these are living things they're making your protein but they're making all the other stuff that they need to be alive uh, purify your protein from all the other stuff and there we go we've got our protein of interest and we've got a very high concentration of it so again this you know one through five was just kind of an overview now let's look more closely at some of these individual steps because there are some important details in here in that first step, we needed to get DNA for the gene of interest, and we needed a high concentration of it. So let's address how, how we do this. Um, first of all, it's actually pretty easy to just get the DNA that you need. If you need a gene for something, uh, it, it's, it's easy to just get DNA from the source organism cells. Um, so you can get the entire genome DNA from source organism cells, whether this is a human, because yeah, this could be used with human proteins, molecular cloning, if there's some human protein that you want uh, you know, to understand more about Alzheimer's disease or you know, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, you could you know, get human DNA from human organism cells, easy to do. But again, molecular cloning, used, used for any organism you want. The problem with getting this DNA from source organism cells is that the yield is low. Uh, if you think about a cell and what percentage of that overall cell mass is actually DNA, it's pretty small. And if you think about a big cell and the overall mass and how much of it is one specific gene that you care about, it's a very low percentage. So it's easy to get the gene that you want, but it's you can't get a high yield of that gene from just grabbing you know skin tissue or you know whatever it is. So we have what we need. We just have a low concentration of it, a low yield of this of this gene. So the solution is to somehow take this gene that we have and copy it over, make more of it. Uh, this should sound familiar from an earlier chapter, what we need to do is DNA replication. We have what we need, we just need to copy it over. So the solution to this low yield problem is to artificially amplify this gene of interest. This is going to be very similar to the DNA replication from many chapters ago, but it's just for this one gene. We're not going to amplify the entire chromosome like we saw in that chapter. So this is a modified type of uh, DNA replication. We're just replicating one gene, and of course we're doing this artificially. There is a name for this technique. This technique of artificial amplification of just one gene is called polymerase chain reaction, also known as PCR. So I'm, I am bringing this up in the context of molecular cloning. In this step one, we just need a lot of our gene of interest. We're using PCR to get a high concentration of this gene. But I wanna point out as kind of a side note, PCR is a widely used technique for lots of other things as well. Um, let's say you have some DNA at a crime scene. Maybe it's a real, it's a 
pretty big puddle of blood from Google image search, but you know, maybe it's just a few skin cells on a cigarette or something like that. You could have a tiny amount of genetic information and use PCR to artificially amplify it so that you can analyze this. Um, you know, uh, this is showing uh, paternity testing where you can take a small amount of DNA and, you know, amplify it first before you make this sort of comparison comparing mother, child, and, you know, potential fathers. Uh, PCR can even be used in, uh, diagnostically. So some of the earlier um, COVID tests worked this way and uh, other tests for pathogens work this way as well, where you, you know, isolate a sample, you try to amplify specific genes, if you're successful in amplifying them, the genes must have been there in the sample. If the amplification doesn't work, there must not have been genes in the sample, and so there's no pathogen there. Um, anyway, all this just to say that this is widely used in a lot of different places. So my, my statement here, PCR has many applications beyond simply molecular cloning. So let's talk about PCR now. Well, before we get into the actual steps of this, I wanna talk about what is actually gonna be in this tube. What are our starting materials, our starting reagents for PCR? Well, uh, first and obviously we've got DNA. You know, we've got some sort of template that we grabbed from you know, host organism cells, wherever. Uh, and importantly, this can be low concentration. Again, we're going to be amplifying it. It's fine if it's low concentration. So we start with source DNA, it's okay if it's a uh, low concentration. Next, we're going to be amplifying DNA. We're gonna be doing DNA replication. So we're gonna need the building blocks of DNA. We're going to need nucleotides, A, G, C, and E. T, not uracil. Uh, so we're also going to need your nucleotides in this in this tiny little tube. Now, you may remember this figure and just how horrendously complicated DNA replication was, especially how many different proteins, how many different enzymes were you know involved in this process. Now, the quick spoiler: we're, we're going to find shortcuts for almost all of these enzymes, but there is one enzyme that we absolutely cannot find a replacement for the one enzyme that we need in this tube is DNA polymerase, the, the enzyme that actually builds DNA. So this is going to be another starting reagent here. And interesting to note, the only protein that's going to be in this tube. Now, going back to this once again, you may remember the first or one of the first steps uh, was making primers with primase. Uh, so you think, how are we gonna how are we gonna replace this functionality? We've got a DNA polymerase, but uh, it can't get started. Uh, surely we must need a primase to make a primer first, right? Well, we're gonna shortcut that as well. Uh, we are going to put into this tube, and yeah, just tube with water and stuff. Uh, we are going to put in DNA primers. So these primers have been specifically designed, we, you, you create these separately in another technique. These DNA, not RNA, these DNA primers have been specifically designed to bind to either end of your gene. Uh, we'll, we'll see this in action in just a couple of slides, but yeah, we're not using primase, we put in DNA primers in this tube. So uh, PCR starting reagents, DNA primers, and uh, again, this is kind of an awkward phrase, but we will see what this looks like in a second. These DNA primers are complementary to sequences on either end of that gene of interest. So we've got all our starting materials. Now we're ready to actually do this thing. So once again, you may remember the very first step in natural inside the cell DNA replication and that was helicase. That was unzipping this double helix in order to get single-stranded templates. Well, we're going to use a shortcut here. Instead of using the helicase enzyme, we're gonna take our double-stranded DNA and heat it up. That's all it takes. We're gonna use really warm temperatures, 95 degrees, so don't memorize this number, but if you're curious, 95 degrees Celsius, it's, it's almost boiling. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, so pretty hot temperatures is not hot enough to damage the DNA, but it is hot enough to make it go from double-stranded 
to single stranded. So perfect shortcut, we avoid having to use this enzyme helicase, we just use heat. So now we're actually talking about the steps of PCR, I'm gonna number these. Step number one, um, heat, again, not writing down the specific numbers, uh, heat to unwind the double-stranded DNA. This is because DNA polymerase needs single-stranded template. Now, our next step, we've got our single-stranded template, we are going to cool the whole thing down a little bit. So again, we're not memorizing that it's 55 degrees Celsius, but it's around there, we're, we're, we're cooling it down. Uh, these lower temperatures are going to allow these DNA primers to bind to this DNA. So this is what I meant with this phrase um, a few slides ago, that these DNA primers are complementary to sequences on either end of our gene of interest. That's what this looks like here. This DNA primer, you, you have to know the sequence of your gene in order to do any of this stuff. This primer has been specifically designed to bind right here, uh, this edge of your gene of interest. And this one binds to this gene, uh, or this end of your gene of interest. They don't bind in the middle, they bind on either side, very specifically. So this is step number two. Again, being qualitative with my warm and cool, just saying cool uh, to allow the DNA primers to bind where they have been designed to bind. Next, we are going to heat slightly. And again, it's 72 degrees Celsius. It's, it's not as hot as it was in step number one. Uh, so I'm going to use the phrase heat slightly as we get warmer than step two, but not as warm as step one. Sorry if that's confusing, but I think it's easier than making you memorize a bunch of numbers. We're going to, quote unquote, heat slightly uh, to allow this DNA polymerase to do its thing. Uh, it's going to take these primers, it's going to extend them, it's going to build DNA 5 prime to 3 prime, build DNA 5 prime to 3 prime. This doesn't take very long since you're only building, you know, one gene's worth of DNA. And uh, yeah, that's the action of our one and only protein enzyme inside of this tube. So our step number three, heat slightly uh, to allow DNA polymerase to extend these primers and replicate DNA. Now, there's a reason why this is called polymerase chain reaction, and that's because once we've finished step number three, we go right back to step number one again. Uh, so all this, uh, this, we've doubled our DNA at this point. Uh, we started with one, now we've got two pieces of double-stranded DNA. When we go back to step number one again, both of those strands of double-stranded DNA are gonna you know, become single-stranded, and we're gonna cool it down, primers are gonna bind, we're gonna heat it again, the enzyme, it's still around, it's gonna extend those primers, and it's gonna double the amount of DNA again. Then, go back to step number one again, heat it nearly to boiling, make it single-stranded, cool it so the primers can bind, heat slightly so the DNA polymerase can do its thing. And then we go back and do it again. So we're gonna do this dozens of times. Each time we go through steps one, two, and three, that's doubling the amount of DNA in the tube. So really PCR is just these three steps, but we're repeating one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. We're repeating this process dozens of cycles. Uh, and yes, we are going to use an instrument called a thermal cycler. You see it pictured here. Um, this is about half the size of a microwave. It's about the size of the spectrophotometers in the BISC-131 teaching labs, if you're taking or have taken that course. Uh, but yeah, a, a, a little smaller than a microwave oven, a standard microwave oven. It sits on a bench top, and yeah, it holds your tiny little tubes and goes through this process of heating and cooling and heating, and then it will go back and heat and cool and heat. It'll even refrigerate your sample when it's done. Uh, how long this takes kind of depends on how big your gene is. Um, but again, this tends to be pretty fast. You're not replicating the entire chromosome, you're just replicating one gene. So you can do this dozens of times and get millions and millions of copies of your gene of interest. And it can take two, three, four hours. Uh, leave it on overnight, it'll refrigerate it for you to come into work the next morning and all your DNA will be ready. So yes, thermal cycle, thermal cycler very important instrument for this process. Now, there's a problem. 
with this technique. There's a problem with what I have presented so far. It has to do with step number one, this, uh, this heating up. So we needed to do this in order to go from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA. That was our shortcut where we didn't need to involve the enzyme helicase. I told you that DNA is not damaged at these high temperatures, but perhaps you remember what happens to proteins when they are heated up to nearly boiling temperatures. When proteins get this hot, they're gonna denature. They're gonna unfold, they're gonna lose their tertiary structure. Maybe you remember this exact slide from earlier in the quarter. So this is a cool technique, but this was, this was imagined many, many, many years before it was actually done because this problem prevented the whole thing from working. So the issue with PCR was that DNA polymerase denatures, it unfolds at the high temperature used in step number one, meaning it's no longer active. So you would have to be adding fresh DNA polymerase protein to the tube every time you went back to step number one, and that's that's just not feasible. So the, the technique was was just was but a dream uh, for many many years. Uh, so the solution to this issue is in some ways an obvious one, and in some ways a, a one that is so clever it won a Nobel Prize. Uh, the problem is our DNA polymerase craps out at high temperatures. So you could think about, hmm, let's, let's design a version of this DNA polymerase protein that is stable at high temperatures. Maybe we'll change the protein sequence. Maybe we'll strengthen up some of these hydrogen bonds here so that it can withstand these high temperatures. As it turns out, trying to sort of custom design a more stable version of this protein or, or any protein is really difficult. If you want a heat stable DNA polymerase enzyme, it is much easier to just steal from nature. So this is where we pull in, you know, again, I, this is a great capstone chapter, pulls in a lot of stuff throughout the quarter. If we want heat stable enzymes, we just have to think about natural selection and selective pressures. In a very hot environment, any organisms living there would have evolved heat-stable enzymes through the process of selective pressure and natural selection. If we find these organisms and use their version of DNA polymerase, it's going to be stable. So as it turns out, again, Nobel Prize winning idea, steal from nature, <laughs> use, use evolution to our advantage. So ultimately, these, uh, these bacteria called Thermus aquaticus, that's their, their name, uh, were found in hot springs, again, boiling temperatures, uh, basically, and their version of DNA polymerase is used in PCR and it works just fine at step one and everything is great, but we need this specific DNA polymerase. So um, you know, there was our problem. Solution, use DNA pol from an organism that lives in very hot environments. Uh, they would have evolved enzymes that function at high temperature, uh, specifically these hot, hot springs living bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. The reason why I'm giving you their, their name like this is because what you'll see is something called TAC polymerase. This is, this is pronounced TAC with a T-A-Q. In, in fact, I think in one of these earlier figures, oh yeah, it says it right there, TAC DNA polymerase. Um, now you know why it is TAC. It's named after Thermus aquaticus. So weird name, but that's the reasoning behind it. TAC polymerase, Thermus aquaticus is, is uh, polymerase. Okay. We are not done with molecular cloning. In fact, we, we've, kind of, we've kind of only just begun. We've, we've just done this first step. We've gotten our DNA uh, and we have a high concentration of it, uh, but obviously there are many other steps before we get to pure protein. This is where I typically end things for uh, lecture 5-4. Um, these last couple of lectures tend to be uh, a little shorter than the other ones, but 
trust me, we will pick up where we left off. We will finish up all the rest of molecular cloning in the next one, but this is the end of 5-4.